Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Art Eldred. I wanted to make a quick adjustment to the program today. Originally, when we submitted the seminar back in August, uh, our anticipation was to have Ohio University come up here and actually do a lean demonstration with you on Lego blocks. Um, it's about a five minute video. I just encourage you afterwards when you go back home, uh, go over to YouTube, search out Lego push demonstration or Lego pull demonstration. It's about a three minute view and you'll actually see the process firsthand. You could actually take back to your workforces and do a demonstration in front of everybody. It's a very simple uh, understanding. Uh, so my name is Art Eldred. First of all, welcome. Thank you for coming here and starting your morning with us this morning. We appreciate you coming out. Um, obviously from the turnout, everybody's pretty interested in lean and distribution. I'll tell you one thing out of the start before I introduce myself. If we start looking around the e-commerce space, one of the things that's out there is a, is a real large, massive e-retailer that starts with a river. Um, and they've been practicing this lean de demonstration or lean systems in e-commerce distribution for a number of years. The rest of us are still trying to catch up to them and we're gonna kind of tell you how to do that today. So my name's Art Eldred, I'm from Vargo Companies. Uh, I've been out here for about uh, a little less than a year with Vargo and recently spent some time with uh, uh, Kiva Systems. So everybody who's familiar with e-commerce knows what Kiva Systems is about with robots. If you wanna talk about that offline, I'll, I'll have another conversation with you and where their fit is. Um, so welcome again, my name's Art Eldred. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tony Hollis. I'm the Director of Engineering for Saddle Creek Corporation. I've been with Saddle Creek going on uh, two years now. Um, a little bit about my background. I spent the first 10 years of my career in the automotive industry doing automotive logistics. So I spent a lot of time with Honda of America. Uh, worked a bit with Daifuku in uh, Detroit, working with the US automotive industry. And then wrapped up my tenure in the automotive industry with uh, BMW Manufacturing Corp. In the last 10 years, I've worked for Excel DHL and, and currently Saddle Creek. Our objective this morning is to talk to you a bit about how Lean's been used historically in automotive manufacturing and how that's transitioning into e-commerce and e-fulfillment. So we're going to talk a bit about contrast. You'll see Tony and I bouncing back throughout this seminar today, of bouncing back and forth on what retail distribution has been, e-commerce distribution is. And the one goal we want you to walk out of here is a little bit of a paradigm shift in thinking. We don't want you to use discrete order picking. We don't want you to find technologies out the floor. We want you to rethink the process from start to finish. And when you think of lean and implementing lean, whether it's in a silo or what we're kind of promoting is more the overall process, and we'll talk a lot about that today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the or origin of lean. We're gonna go through a push and pull distribution center and just talk about it in generalities. Don't get fixated too much on the concepts that are out there, but try and relate that to your businesses as they are today. Um, we're also going to kind of fill back into say when is pool distribution or a continuous flow distribution really ideal for your marketplace. We're going to try and give you some, some characteristics of what that business might look like. And then we're going to talk about what are the barriers. And I think that's going to be a really important comment because when you leave here today, we want you to understand those barriers and start thinking about a paradigm of how do I actually implement this in a distribution center. So I put the slide up here to kind of do a little bit of a demonstration to just get you out of the mindset. If you look on the left-hand side, it's traditionally what you're seeing in the retail world. On the right-hand side is more of the e-commerce space. But the thing that we want you to think about is in the retail space, and I'm going to characterize a lot of things into consumer product goods manufacturers today where you're shipping pallets of products in and out or retail boxes. But on the left-hand side, I've actually got a static plan that I'm planning for. Orders drop once a day. When that order drops, I go through a, a kind of a minutia of planning out what am I going to do, what's my labor force going to look like, what, what areas am I going to put my workforce into, and what's my plan and goals for certain periods of the day. It's a very static position, a very static uh, plan that happens throughout the day. On the right-hand side, we're talking more about the e-commerce space and doing things on real time, ad hoc, and not necessarily being able to stick to any type of plan. The best process on the right-hand side is to dynamically react to what's happening in your business. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about little characteristics in the business, but you know, if I'm shipping out 150 car seats off of a conveyor system that goes to a sorter into a trailer, that's one thing. But if I have a car seat that needs to be mixed with a binky or a car seat that needs to be mixed with a apparel outfit and they're changing minute to minute, that creates some complexities for a traditional based system to ship in two items orders versus 150 going into a trailer. Let me talk to you for a few minutes about the origin of lean in manufacturing. Uh, certainly the, when you talk about lean, the first thing that comes to mind is the Toyota production system. Sort of very an Eastern view of quality and management, but I think it's appropriate that we, we start and we look at, at lean with respect to Henry Ford because many of the Japanese auto ma manufacturers looked at people such as Ford and looked at Taylor and looked at Deming 
and really build a lot of their philosophies, these lean tools, um, on the basis of a lot of the research and a lot of the success that, that folks had before them. So in terms of Henry Ford developed a production line looking at standard work using standard tools, tight specifications. Taylor used the scientific method. Deming brought forth a lot of the, the quality principles that are used today. Something I thought about as, as Art and I talked about today, what to share with you. Initially, I thought, well, we can talk about 5Y, 5S, fish bones. Well, those are a lot of tactics that have been written extensively about. And I thought, you know, what are the challenges that I've seen in terms of using lean in manufacturing and order fulfillment? And I think that those challenges are really at a very strategic level. That the, the Japanese, when they look at lean, you know, they really start looking initially, or the, the primary focus was really on muda or waste. And uh, while there's a relentless pursuit of continuous improvement and looking at waste and non-value added and value added processes, that this is not in the exclusion of anything else. You can look at waste and engineer and re-engineer a process that has upstream or downstream effects that um, are something that you, you hadn't anticipated that may not be productive for, for the entire process. So it's something to consider. Outside of looking at the elimination of waste, there are other strategic lean aspects that you have to consider. There's a, a concept that's called Murray. Murray is the aspect of having respect for the associates. So this, this nature of, of employee relationship and being able to speak openly about the opportunities is key. So if you look only at the improvement opportunity itself and you're not in an environment where people on both sides of the discussion can speak openly, you're probably not going to get to efficiency as fast as you can. You may not realize as much efficiency as you can. The last aspect of, of lean strategically is this concept called Mura. Mura is about flow. And at, when I, I first went to Honda, I had a quality manager who was a mentor of mine, and he talked about the, the joy of manufacturing. Before there was talk of lean, there was, it was a very visual sort of, of uh, thing at Honda. They talked about the joy of manufacturing. And, and when we were going through some lean training, he, he spoke to me about processes being like music. There's a harmony, a beat, a pitch, and you need to, to pay attention to that. And you need to make sure that, that as a business that we're making good music. And if you look at the process in terms of this music, if you will, that then you can apply these other tools and get to a better place. So if I'm, I'm looking at that in an orchestra level and I'm trying to tune my string section and I'm working on the lean process, I'm not looking at the overall process from end to end. The optimization of a silo within the organization may actually do harm on the front end and the back end. So in the end, I might have optimized something, but to what expense did I optimize that at? So when we want to, when we go through this optimization process and talking about pulling orders through a distribution center, we want you to think about, it starts with what order completes to deduct the next order. We'll talk a little bit about different types of auto production. We started with Henry Ford, and he really was the father of, of auto manufacturing and mass production. And early on when he was making the Model T, people interviewed him and were talking about his expectations in terms of the Ford uh, Auto Company, in terms of the Model T. And uh, he was talking about the, the car he was making. And uh, when they were asking him about questions about what considerations there were for the car, he goes, well, you can have any car you want as long as it's black. Well, that was obviously a very long time ago, very stringent controls, not a lot of flexibility. Well, we've moved a long way from that today. So when I started with Honda back in the uh, early 90s, I was exposed to a lot of the Toyota style uh, processes, and really what that did was allowed for more flexible manufacturing to, to take place. What was interesting to me was as we see these lots of cars in these different colors is that underneath the cars are very similar. So the flexible tooling that we hear about as part of the Toyota production system was really based on a lot of commonality, not so much an exception basis. So there were different colors, there were different engines, there were different trim classes, but there was still a fair amount of commonality. From a material flow point of view, from a supply chain point of view, these cars in production were built on lots. The, a lot of 60 cars was what we built to. So if you got a shipment of parts and you got one box of 60 parts, uh, four boxes of 15, two boxes of 30. So there were a lot of efficiencies driven through using this more, more of a, a flexible type of production in batches. And, and uh, it made for many efficiencies at this point in time. 
and at that, when I was at Honda, it was a, a, a great time as an engineer. And then when I'd moved on and then went on to BMW Manufacturing Corp, I was exposed to this concept of mass customization. What was, what was very different is while mass production or more flexible mass production as part of the Toyota production system produces cars, this mass customization begins with orders from the dealership in many cases for a very um, unique bill of material. BMW in Europe had this program called the Unique Car Program. You could go to a dealership and if you were wearing a blazer or a tie that you thought was a really interesting color, you could actually have them do a color match to your interior or exterior based on swatches of clothing. So it introduced a lot of complexity. So what BMW started being able to do was have a massive bill of material that they could use to build a very unique car for a customer. And then they had to plan process around that to get to a, a truly customized product. So this is an example of a traditional push base. If you look at you know, the big box retailers of the world, or if you're going to apparel stores, if you're going to a retail outlet of some sort, it's a traditional label. There's some variation to this, but primarily I've got uh, full trailers coming in with LTL shipments coming in. I've got full trailers going outbound, LTL shipments going outbound. I do my receiving process. My reserve storage is a, a dense way of storing product, shrinking the footprint of the warehouse, but it holds all the product in anticipation of demand coming. And then I go one step farther and I start these case pick modules, unit pick modules. I might be picking off the floor, I might be picking out a flow rack, but that reserve storage is pushed to a four location. It's not pushed because I have an order for it, it's pushed because the hole is asking for product to be pushed to it. If I have a pallet position, I have one case left on the front pack, I'm gonna go ahead and put another pallet right behind it because I know I'm gonna be picking it. So I'm gonna move those cases in forward in anticipation of work being done on those cases. The outbound side is again, Fairly simple, straightforward, but I'm moving things in mass through the system. I'm moving those 150 car seats, I'm moving those 300 Xbox games, I'm putting it to a retail store and they're all ordered and shipped on one single trailer. From a pool-based perspective, um, this is a little bit of a paradigm in the way that we look at how we're processing orders. So think about, again, Tony's talking about the manufacturing lines and how I'm building not just black cars, but I'm, I'm ad hoc delivering and building to what my, my customers are ordering. In a pool-based distribution, I'm gonna contrast that back to the push base. The push base is saying, I've got the drop of an orders, I'm gonna take my volume, I'm gonna push it into the trailer, I know what my workload is for the day, I'm gonna plan for it, I'm gonna staff for it, and I'm gonna monitor that through the process. And in a pool-based distribution environment where I'm actually having an order that comes at two o'clock that I wanna get out at 2.15 in the afternoon, I've gotta look at my capacity by starting at the reverse end. So we normally start at the shipping side. What inducts work into the system is not the anticipation of what's coming, but what's actually occurred. So as I complete an order in the shipping dock, I'm actually going back to the process and inducting work back to the process. So as opposed to putting reserve storage out here, in an e-com world, we want everything available at every time. We don't want to make that time and push something up in advance in anticipation of work. We want to be able to, to go to a product, pick the location, and send it out the door immediately. We don't want to wait for those tasks to occur. So in, in most of the e-commerce worlds that are practicing pool days distribution, I might have a carton of storage in every single one of these areas. I gather my products, my items, and you might think of it as technologies from voice picking, RF picking, cart picking, but I'm gathering product. I'm not picking discreetly to an order. I'm picking this product, putting onto a cart, and I'm going down to an order assembly station. At the order assembly station, I now have all this product that was met to my demand. Now I'm starting to assemble, not a car, but I'm assembling an e-commerce order and putting my product into the outbound box. The packing, bags, manifesting, and shipping stations are all have a continuous flow back and forth. So when we look at lean processes, focus here is I start on the back end. When I complete an order, I induct another one in. This process is managed end to end over top through an order management system um, or a warehouse management system that can do pool type distribution. The technologies, the solutions that are underneath it here are fairly irrelevant. How I execute my orders and my work task is a technology based and that's warranted on how much labor you're spending, what your product types are, whether I'm using conveyors, I'm using lights, I'm using RF. We want you to think about the process of pooling product through the distribution center. In contrast, um, from an automotive perspective, when we look at mass customization for BMW Corp, they would look at each bill of material for each car as it hit the line. So those 
pulse signals would be triggered, and they would look at those parts that are common to all cars, and they would have a, a combine replenishment strategy. So those parts that were common came out of an automated storage and retrieval system that was in our warehouse that was attached to the building with the conveyor. So anytime that trigger happened, the pallet would be grabbed with the crane, would come to assembly, and it could be taken to the line. The more unique products, they had hundreds of different headlights and steering wheel combinations. So if you look at headlights, they had some that were heated, some that had um, windshield wipers on them, had xenon lights, so there were all these different combinations. As that bill of material was exploded, they would then pick those by hand out of either the bottom of the ASRS or they had goods demand applications on the unit load side. So what was interesting was that, that those things that were picked in sequence and uniquely were shipped to the plant, then they would print out a, a delivery sheet to tell them where to take it on the line. So one by one, those were taken to the line just in time to build a unique car. So we're not doing a parcel outbound, but this evaluation of a large product portfolio or large numbers of SKUs and looking at that demand signal and adjusting resources and using technology intelligently was certainly key to delivering a unique car. One of the keys I also hear is everything that I do in the process chain here is small increments of work. The small increment of work is down to the level of a, of a customer's order. If they've ordered three lines per order, I'm introducing three lines per order through that process. When I start looking at small increments of work, I start thinking about work cell environments too. Work cells are great. We use them in the automotive industry for, world, for, for years. And they're great in aspects of they increase the ergonomics of the work cell, which make a friendlier, happier workforce. I'm more productive, I'm more accurate, I'm more repetitive. And if I'm efficiently flowing work to that work cell, and that's the key part, is that I'm efficiently flowing the work on a consistent basis, the productivity overall at the end of the day should be a lot higher in a work cell than one that is more in a batch environment where I'm starting a work and then ending work. So let's talk a little bit about waving for just a few minutes. Here's a, a, a customer that we looked at a few years ago that had eight waves uh, throughout the day. In these eight waves, one of the things that you're noticing is there's a good output of work when I'm in the center of the wave. I've got an efficient throughput or efficient output of work. The pitfalls that we're seeing is when I start the work and when I end the work. When I start the work, as I'm prepping, I'm printing labels, I'm delegating workforce assignments, I'm trying to manage down to what that batch is going to look like in anticipation of how that batch is going to unfold as I start doing the production on it. At the end of the process, I'm going back and looking at the exceptions that need to be taking place, did all my work get completed? Did I delegate my workforce? Did they actually go where I thought they were going to work? So I've got this head and tail of a wave that ends up having a big gap in efficiencies. So in a traditional environment, what we've been doing over the years, we've evolved, right? We've gone through batch. Our operations don't look like that. If I went to a, a retail box and looked at the shipping sorter, I'm flowing a good 200 cartons per minute out the door, and I don't see those pitfalls. The reason is that I've learned to do batch overlaps. I start one batch and I start going into the next batch, so that gap is filled by another batch in the center. What that's done to us is it's masked the inefficiencies that are happening behind the scenes. So it's great, I'm looking at this throughput going into the trailer, but in reality, my labor is still doing this inside the operations. I'm still delegating, I'm still planning, I'm still, still monitoring that batch and the exception processes, and I've really hurt and harmed my workforce. What's the ideal flow? Well, if I could get rid of batches altogether, I could efficiently drive work through my workforce, right? So again, if I go back to a pool based distribution versus a wave-based distribution, waves, masses of work are planned for, monitored, and pushed throughout your system. In a continuous flow, I'm completing an order on the shipping dock, and I'm inducting another one into the process. There is no concept of a wave or a batch. What triggers induction or work that occurs is still your business rules. It's still the, the priority of the order. It's still the date of the order. When we start looking at processes of how you induct work, it's not just, hey, how do I go to the next order? We're going to look at the order pool that's out there and say, what order popped up to the top of the bubble, and when do I start that process? And I'll give you an example of uh, one of the things that we look at is at 1.50 in the afternoon, and I've got to get everything out the door by 2 o'clock, it's really important to know what work I need to do as well as what work I do not need to do. 151, thunderstorm hits, my electricity goes out, the power shuts down. Comes back up at 110, or sorry, 210. 20 minutes later, I've already passed the cutoff. Do I still want to work that order in that batch that was in the work in progress? No, I'd rather go back to the beginning, pick up the next order that needs to go out for the three o'clock order cutoff. So when I have these masses of work that's in progress in front of me, I have to complete them. I can't kind of rearrange, jumble, or dynamically adapt to what my customers are asking for. 
Another consideration is when you look at systems design, you've got utilization, availability, and uptime considerations. So if you're, you're not taking a close look at all those variables, you may not get the sort of yield you need out of an integrated system. So I think that the, the graphic here depicts trying to maximize all of those variables. So I'm not going to read through this in detail, but again, what we're trying to get you to think about, again, is, is the differences between planning for work and how you're operating your batch environments and your wave environments and why that's kind of evolved over the years. And again, I talk a little bit about the evolution of batch overlap, but we keep taking that same solution and we keep trying to adapt it to the next process. On the right-hand side, I'm really talking about the paradigm that says what happens and how do I dynamically adapt? How do I react to, to business changes? How do I react to that Xbox that is going out one unit, not a pallet of units? How do I take that Xbox that was hot with an NBA game and all of a sudden adapt it over to now the NFL game? And that, how, how often does that fly happen? And in the e-commerce world, probably the biggest thing that we saw as a, as a trend this year, and you all should pay attention to this, is what marketers are doing with that little thing called free shipping. Free shipping takes your order line count and drives it right down to the one Tuesday lines. When I take away free shipping, all of a sudden my lines borders start going up because I want to make use of my shipping processes. So one of the things that we saw as one of the largest trends in e-commerce over this peak holiday, and it was quite shocking because all of our clients were going through this, was that 2.6 lines per order was starting to go up to three point lines or four point lines or five point lines. To react to that dynamically is really important. It doesn't happen tomorrow. It doesn't happen next week that you can plan for it. It happens in two hours. It happens in 30 minutes. It happens before you even realized it. So when is pool-based ideal? Um, <laughs> a good friend of mine told me the story, and I think it's kind of funny. If your plan starts the day and is no better than me going out and pulling my widgie board underneath of a table and starting to say, is my plan better than the widgie board? Then you're probably more in a reactive dynamic allocating mode. You need to be able to look at your business and say, am I supposed to be able to adapt to what's happening to the curve or am I trying to plan for what's happening to the curve? So systemically, we need to look at our order volumes, the way that we're dropping and what our consumers are asking for and what they're saying how their order profiles occur, we have no control of that. That's control of the marketing team. That's control of the e-commerce store. Um, but in general, I can look at high amount of active items. I look at the large number of destinations and orders. So again, I go back to that retail box that had you know, maybe 100 stores on the end of the shipping lines. My stores are now 120, 50,000 orders. It's every single client that placed an order on the website becomes a destination in this system. Unpredictable order volumes. I could come in at, at 11 o'clock at night and have a whole lot of orders run it dry because nobody's ordering usually through the night and I start back up in the morning and I've got nothing to do. So we have to be able to react to what that order pool or order well looks like and balance your workforce to make those things occur. And I think the last thing is really important, varying degrees of business rules. Business rules for an e-commerce customer are never the same as they were the day before. And that's because somebody called you and said, we really need to get these out the door or this is going to go hot and that needs to go hot. So you try and dynamic react, you're like, oh, the Xbox is going live with the NBA, I, need, I better get that NBA game up to the front slot and put a pallet of work up there. We can't react fast enough for e-commerce customers if we're striving for same day shipping, let alone shipping out the door in three minutes. The other thing I think is really important is we all order on, online in e-commerce in here, and the best thing in the world is when we place an e-commerce order, and two hours later we get the email saying it was picked, packed, and shipped, and it was handed off to who? UPS, FedEx, or some other information I can track. So if that order doesn't arrive in five or 10 days, I never blame the place I placed the order on, I blame the parcel carrier. So we are striving for get that order picked, packed, and shipped and into a trailer and off to a customer that they can start tracking that. Okay, so what's taking so long for Lean to really take on in, in uh, e-fulfillment and distribution space? I think. From what I've seen many times, Lean is, is treated as a, as a sort of a special project. And, and the challenge therein is, it, and done in silos, you never fully realize all the efficiency potential that's out there. There's a, um, a strategy called Hoshin Kanri that the uh, Japanese have regarding Lean, and that's really about the cascading goals and objectives of an organization. So understanding what, what the direction is of the company, what sort of efficiencies they plan to have, so it's an entire organizational engagement. Uh, a big part of this outside of tools and tactics is the change management aspect of adopting lean in an organization. 
And before we go really deep into using lean to take into a, uh, get rid of waste, we have to start very broad and look at our sort of macro level processes. Uh, Art had mentioned uh, about looking at sales and marketing about free shipping and they're going to have certain campaigns for certain SKUs. We have to, to understand that so we can react to it. Equally, we have to work with our vendors and understand their capabilities. We have to communicate with them so they're able to work with us to meet these ends. So those are some of the dynamics that we need to, to consider. In terms of information systems, we, we go from an environment that, that focuses heavily on, on warehouse management to a system that now needs order management, warehouse management, warehouse control systems, and parcel management systems. So we have a lot of systems complexity. You know, as, as, as 3PL, we're, we're used to ASN and EDI, bills of lading, labeling specifications of being complexity we manage. Well, suddenly we're in a space with e-fulfillment where we've got gift wrapped, we're looking at poly bags, we're looking at envelopes, gift cards. All this suddenly becomes part of our daily business and we really don't have a lot of time to react and it's a huge amount of complexity to manage. In terms of a lack of lean experts, well, given the recession or the economic downturn in the past uh, several years, certainly people have moved out of the automotive and heavy industry that have lean experience that have moved into other industry verticals much like myself. But this isn't about a, a person or a group of persons coming in to save the day within an organization. It's taking these concepts and then teaching to everyone within the organization so they all can use the tools to maximize the efficiency. And I think when you look at someone that works perhaps in a warehouse or on a dock plate somewhere, and you know, how can they help move things forward, aside from having these ideas about what they see every day, we need to help them build a business case. So they don't really have access to data to understand what volumes are, are involved or what's the cost of labor or how do you build a business case. So engineers and IS people and quality people, we've really got to work with the people that we have out on the floor and help them build those business cases for change. So we, aside from being teachers, we end up being coaches and trainers out on the floor. So in order to really make the, the most useful um, application of these tools, it's really a, a large endeavor that an organization has to consider. You know, one of the things you, you, you think about, is this a revolution or is this an evolution? And I, I really see this as an evolution of the way that we think about processing those orders. Um, you know, I put it up here as a, as a kind of a key point to talk about, and that is our systems are still siloed. We may have a warehouse management system, we may have some of the top tier WMSs out there, we may have a legacy WMS, we may have a sortation system, we might have an ASRS if we're really you know, advanced in our automation uh, practices. Uh, and then we have Pictolite systems, we've got RF systems, but in reality, none of them ever really talk to each other. They become execution arms, and they're not looking at the overall process. So that's great that I might be able to get my picking a little better. I might use batch pick to put. I go to a, a, to a location, I pick product into a cart, and then I put it over and put it into a put wall. But the problem that you're having with that is you still have masses of work that you're going back and forth. You still have the waves. So you induct a portion of wave, you get through a chunk of work, you come back and you monitor it, and you start another induction portion of work. Um, we need to have systems, and this is something that the automotive industry struggled with for years, and when they finally executed upon this, is they had a strong back-end system that monitored the execution, the allocation uh, of work, and monitored the process from top to back. There's, sure, there's layers of technology underneath. There's still a place for Pictolite, there's still a place for sorters, there's still a place for ASRS, but you need to have somebody on top telling those systems what they need to do when they do it. And when you pull an order through, you can still use a Manhattan warehouse management system and go into an auto wave process where you're actually dumping the work into the execution arm to do that. So this is one of those big things that you've got to really search out, find where the software partners are that can help you execute end-to-end -end employing distribution product. So the path forward. Let me start with saying that you know one of the, the the premises that we have to look at regarding lean is that it starts with the voice of the customer. What are their requirements for cost, quality, and timeliness? And from an e-commerce EFA from a perspective, we're closer to the voice of the customer perhaps than we've ever been. So what does that really mean? It means we don't have a lot of time to react when we get these orders. Instead of like an automotive industry that has days or weeks to build a car, and work with their supply chain to get these parts in. We have, we have hours typically to get this out the door and work with our vendors. We have systems, very complex systems. We have a tremendous amount of data. 
So in terms for us to be effective as supply chain professionals, we've got to make the best use of the talent. So that's part of our associate engagement. We have to make the best use of these lean tools in order to exact the right amount of efficiency out of these very complex systems for refulfillment. Yeah, I think the quote says it bet. It's not a half-hearted attempt at doing this. It really takes an organization, an end-to-end -end viewpoint of your operation to go to a lean environment. And lean or waveless or batchless, whatever you want to call the terminology, um, it is, is a process that can adapt to omni-channel, it can adapt to retail, it can go over to e-commerce. But the key is that the organization needs to overtake it. If you look at, you know, again, the largest e-commerce customer that's out there that's succeeding, they developed a lot of these tools and back-end processes in-house in so that they can monitor it. They still have cartons, they still have conveyors, they still have rack, they still have inventory that they're dealing with, but their, their back-end end-to-end system was something that they had kind of formulated behind the scenes. There are systems out there that do that. And I think one of the reasons why you're not seeing a big adoption uh, into the e-commerce places that there aren't many. You can look over your left shoulder and right shoulder, you can walk around the show floor today, and you're gonna find there's very few clients or vendors that are offering end-to-end -end solutions. They're out there, you just have to dig hard. Thank you very much for attending. We're, uh, Tony and I are up here for, for quite a few more minutes on any questions and answers that we might be able to help you with. Um, obviously, Tony comes from a, a big background of Black Belt and Six Sigma. Uh, and has been practicing 